Christian. Um, so, so you're in the retreat for all our students here, and I'm sure it'll be a really wonderful time for you. And second, I want to say that um, I, I want to take sort of no particular credit for what I'm going to be talking about. One of the nice things about a summer school is that you don't have to talk about your own work, but you can teach work. Um, of other people that you find illuminating. And so this is material that helped me to think about space and time in a completely new way. Um, and no particular dog in this fight, I'm offering it to you completely. Um, so one of the most uh, important things a problematic moment like this in the development of physics does is to make us sort of go back to the drawing board and really re-examine re some things that we take for granted. In particular, I think, and this is what so it came up a little bit at the end of Christian's talk, um, what it means to see something at a particular place in space and time. So that's what I'm going to be talking about today. We'll talk a little bit more about it next time, in particular the temporal case next time, um, and then then you know bring it back to address more specifically questions about empirical coherence. So. Um, it's going to be a lot more about perception than probably you thought that you would get. Um, but bear with me, and I hope it will lend, I mean, it will sort of lend some light, shed some light. So you conceive of yourself as You conceive of yourself as one object among others in spatially and temporally extended world. And you conceive of your experience as determined both by the state of the world and how you are positioned in it, that is, your oriented location in it. You conceive of the world as consisting of objects, properties that are accessible from points of view other than your own. You draw a distinction between your experiential states and the things that they represent, or the things that you think of them as seeing or giving you information about. These are all just descriptive facts about the structure of your percept. And by percept here, I mean the content of your representational state, the sort of thing that you would describe to someone if they said, what are you seeing? And it's descriptive remarks about the amount of articulation in your representational state. Now, the cognitive infrastructure that makes it possible to see in that sense, the cognitive infrastructure that makes um, possible the representation of space is non trivial An understanding of the fact that I'm a subject of experience in an independent world made possible, um, is made possible by my interpreting my experience as being from a particular point of view in a spatial realm that contains and is independent of that point of view. So why tie the conception of an objective world in the above sense, that is a world independent of experience, represented in experience, and as perceived from a point of view, to the idea of space, to spatial representation. Now this is an idea that, that goes back at least as far as Kant, um, and is put quite nicely by Strassen in this book here, Peter Strassen, right? Roughly speaking, the crucial idea for us is that a spatial system of objects through which oneself through which oneself and other object moves, but which extends beyond the limits of one's observation at any moment, or more generally, is never fully revealed to observation at any moment. This idea obviously supplies the necessary non-temporal dimension for, so to speak, the housing of objects, which are held to exist continuously though unobserved. Thus, the most familiar and easily understood sense in which there exist entities that I do not now perceive is this, that there are places at which those entities are perceptible, but these are places at which I am not now positioned. So that's the idea of space as the dimension in which things are housed when I'm not looking at them. Now, one might begin to talk about objectivity and space with Barclay or Kant, but I'm going to start with Marx's wonderful little book, Space and Geometry. Now in that book, what Mark, uh, what Mark argues is that physical, or in his terminology, geometric space, is an abstraction from what he calls physiological space, which was itself built out of atomic spatial information delivered by the senses and motor activity. So this line proceeds in two stages. First, there are arguments to the effect that physiological sensation, and by here he just means you know, kind of the manifold associated with different senses, tactile, auditory, visual, he thinks that, that these things are intrinsically spatial in character. 
And then the second stage involves hypotheses um, about how objective space is extracted from this, these physiological spaces. So the first stage, and that's the stage that I'm going to be focusing on, runs something like this. He says, from the observation that animals have sense organs composed of one or two dimensional arrays of sensory elements, such as tactile receptors on the skin, photoreceptors in the retina, such that each element by itself can distinguish among one of, a number, of some number of stimulus conditions. Mock thinks that such an arrangement is going to be well suited to providing two kinds of information, and he calls these what and where information. So the what information is provided by a specific response of each one of these elements um, that's stimulated, regard of which element, that is a single tactile receptor might respond in one way to light stimulation and in another way um, to greater pressure. Whereas the identity of the element in the array is responding regardless of the character of the response. Right? So not the internal dimensions. It's not registering the internal dimensions, but it's rather registering which of the elements in the array um, is, is being sort of is giving information, provides information about where this stimulus is located. So Mach thinks the per this is a quote from Mach, the perfect biological adaptation of large groups of connected elementary sensory organ or, um, organs among one another is thus very distinctly expressed by the perception of space. So such an array of elementary um, sensory receptors makes it available a kind of physiological space, according to Ma, of a certain character. So there's visual space, there's tactile space, etc. And this is what Ma says. The physiological spaces of different senses embrace a general physical domain, which are only in part coincident. Almost the entire surface of the skin is accessible to the sense of touch, but only a part of it is visible. On the other hand, the sense of sight, as a telescopic sense, extends in general very much farther physically, yet loosely connected as the different space sensations, the different space sensations of the different senses may originally have been, they still enter into connection through association. So the idea is you've got spatial manifolds, as it were, associated with the different senses, and they're partly overlapping, and so you get this large space by associating these different sensory manifolds with one another, and he thinks the egocentric space of the organism, according to Mach, is built from the spaces by sensory arrays and the behavioral actions appropriately, uh, and, and appropriate to the associated stimuli. So spaces are sort of given directly in sense experience, and then it's sort of refined by coordinating the different manifolds with one another. Now, there's two things to say about this. First, the argument really works by trading on a kind of ambiguity in the term space. So in one sense of the term space is just any three, to, it is kind of what, what he calls sometimes geometric space and what I'm going to call physical space or just space, which is space in the sense that Strassen was referring to when he talked about the dimension in which objects are housed. That's the three-dimensional external space of the extended physical universe, which contains objects. It can be a common object of multiple different sensory modalities. Um, in a second sense, space just refers to any set of ordered elements. So it's, it's a, a purely kind of geometric and mathematical sense of space. So to see the difference, note that the pitches to which the human auditory apparatus is sensitive are often arranged in a sort of one-dimensional continuum from lower to higher. Indeed, receptors, hair cells, in the cochlea are arranged in, a, as a one-dimensional line of hair sensitive to different pitches. So they comprise a physiological space in Mach's sense of a physiological space. By, by his standard, they, when you hear something, it registers one of the hairs on the cochlea, you have a, represent, a perception of space. But no one would mistake this kind of space for space in the, in the physical sense. What the sensory organs are delivering there are spaces only in the purely mathematical or geometric sense. 
So I'm going to use manifold just as a kind of blanket term for a set of elements over which a distance measure is defined. And this includes, as a special case, the continuous ordered elements of locations made up by real space. But it also includes, for example, the one-dimensional arrangement of pitches. It's not an ideal choice of terminology, but it'd be good enough for our purposes. And I'm going to use space, or physical space, either in a subjective or egocentric form, to mean the external physical space, the dimension in which objects are housed. So it should be clear that with the disambiguation, where Mach goes a little bit wrong, so there's no more reason to interpret sensory information delivered by the two-dimensional sheet of the retina as spatial than there is to interpret the different pitches as indicating different spatial locations. What we're given in sensation is manifolds in the sense of us, and what we need is an explanation of why some sensory manifolds give rise to experience interpreted as spatial, interpreted as, as, as you know, referring to locations in external space and objects and that, and so So the second thing to point out is that for Mach, space as perceptual experience is tied to an organism's sensory motor activity. When Mach says that the various sensory element manifolds are coordinated by association, he meant that for these associations to be established, we need motor engagement with the objects of perception. It's through action that the various sensory manifolds are brought into appropriate coordination because it's through action and intentional movement that the interrelationships between, say, sight and touch are exhibited or made manifest. So if I see a speaker in front of me, I know that I, I can sort of reach out and touch them. I also know that, that uh, I can ex what I can expect to see if I move around it and how the sound will change if it's, a, if it's admitting sounds, how the sound will change when I move closer and farther away. So, now notice that motor activity can also be represented and regarded as its own kind of manifold, in much the same way that one can specify a sensory location by means of a coordinate tied to a sense organ retinal photoreceptor A, or tactile receptor B, where A and B are elements in the manifold or an ordered array. One can also specify various aspects of motor activity in terms of coordinates as well. So for example, it's possible to specify the location of my hand relative to my torso by giving the angles of my shoulder um, and elbow joints. Given that my shoulder has three and my elbow one degree of freedom, one can specify my hand position relative to my torso as a point in a four-dimensional joint angle space. It's a sort of motor manifold that represents the position of my arm. My motor commands to sort of, you know, the parts of my body, or what are called in the kind of cog side literature, effectors. Governing my shoulder and arm are thus ways of kind of affecting trajectories through the joint angle manifold. Of course, one can also supply, uh, specify forces applied to various joints as a point in the manifold as well. They too are sets of ordered elements. So this is all just giving us ways of representing motor activity along with sort of sensory information in terms of manifolds or points and spaces um, associated with the different parts of the body. So as such, what Mach referred to as associations between sort of physiological spaces can now be described just as coordinations among manifolds. So this is all historical background to an idea that I think is correct at its core, and that's that the right way to understand a lot of what cognitive, have, cognitive science has taught us about spatial representation in human beings. And the idea is that a creature represents space, that is physical space, at least in its egocentric form, um, is able to, or a, a creature that's able to sort of grasp the thoughts about locations of things in egocentric space, in virtue of its mastery of a whole bunch of sensory motor skills. So although from a modern perspective, Mach was a little bit too quick in interpreting manifolds associated with physiologic, with vision and touch and um, other senses as having intrinsic geomet uh, spatial significance. 
he did have the correct idea that the various sensory manifolds are coordinated by associations that are affected through motor engagement with the objects that they contain information about. So the idea is that it's through action that the various sensory manifolds are brought into appropriate coordination with one another so that you associate the object seen with the object felt. Um, and it's because through action, and it's, sorry, it's through action that they're brought into coordination because it's through action that the interrelationships between the object that you see and the object that you touch are made manifest. So what distinguishes bare manifolds from space is that, as it were, real space is where one's sensory states and behavioral actions or motor behaviors are appropriately integrated. Or better, egocentric space is, and this is just giving a name to what I was saying, the represent egocentric space is, in cognitive terms, the represented manifold in which sensations and motor activities are coherently and appropriately coordinated. So for example, think of it this way. It doesn't matter where, it, sorry, it doesn't matter if a creature locates a, a bit of food as being at a location X in egocentric space, by sight, or by touch, or by hearing. Once they have the thought that it's located at X, which they can do from, you know, through any one of those sensory um, pathways, if it's located there, then the same equivalence class of motor programs will be sufficient to obtain the food. So the, the location is represented in a way that's indifferent to which manifold which one gets information about, but that kind of triggers a bunch of motor um, sort of potential motor pathways to engaging with the food. Similar systematic coordinations between perception and action simply do not obtain for pitch, and that's what makes pitch not a spatial manifold, merely a sensory manifold. It doesn't contain spatial information in that sense. So once egocentric space has been constructed by the stabilization of, of uh, coordinations among the manifolds and their relationship to motor engagement, it's not tied exclusively to any modality. And the stabilization is required to sort of create the behavioral space, that is the space which gives you information about motor interaction with the objects represented, are stabilizations that depend on motor manifolds as much as sensory manifolds. So the idea is if you just had sensation but no motor engagement, you wouldn't really have a space in the sense intended here. When one gets a new pair of glasses, or more obviously when one sort of, you know, wears prisms that alter the relationship between eye-head movement and change of retinal location, it takes some time to adjust. You have to sort of re-coordinate the sensory manifolds with motor manifolds to regain the sort of stability that you need in order to know, you know how to touch the thing that you're looking at. Now something like this idea is uh, found throughout the historical discussion of spatial experience. We saw it in Ma, um, Evans, Gareth Evans says much the same thing when he writes, the subject hears the sound at coming, <coughs> hears the sound as coming from such and such a position. But how is the position to be specified we envisage specifications like this. He hears the sound up or down, to the right or to the left, in front of or behind or over there. It's clear that these terms are egocentric terms. They involve the specification of the position of the sound in relation to the observer's own body. But the egocentric terms derive their meaning from their complicated connections with the actions of the subject. Auditory input, or rather the complex property of auditory input, which codes the direction of the sound, acquires spatial content for an organism by being linked with behavioral output. This is all an attempt to sort of get at what it really means to have direct visual or tactual awareness of space. It doesn't just mean having sensation, it has a sort of complicated backstory that involves coordination among sensory methods. Is that Gareth Evans? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So there's actually abundant empirical evidence to support this idea that spatial representation 
demands motor engagement. How many people have seen? Okay, so these are, I'm just going to be describing very quickly old experiments, but this is one that's very famous. It was done in 1963 by Held and Hein with kittens. Um, they, they have this sort of apparatus that harnesses the kittens to little small gondolas. And they've arranged it so that the from Craig that I had the kitten stories. I should know that. Is that right? Does he do this? Uh, so you'll go away with soft, fuzzy feelings without it. <laughs> but no, they, they actually they did it with kittens, obviously, because they didn't want grown, um, grown cats that had already kind of established uh, motor coordination. So they took them from birth, actually, the kittens, and they exposed them to nearly identical visual input. So they had the same visual input. This is actually quite cruel. So the difference was that they were harnessed to these little gondolas, they had the same visual input because it went around and around and around and the visual environment wasn't changed. Only one of the kittens was, at, was allowed to actively explore its environment, so it got to initiate sort of motor engagement. Um, it didn't just have visual input. The other was passively moved in an identical manner around visual um, stimuli. Yeah, so in terms of the present theory, and this is actually true, only the first kitten was to effectively co was able to effectively coordinate between its motor and sensory, in this case visual manifolds. So it didn't know how to, the one that was only passively moving, didn't know how to kind of reach out and get the food that it was looking at, for example, even though it had had the same, both the same visual input and was kind of passively moved in the same way as the second one because it wasn't able itself to establish the internal coordinations that are needed for the real perception of space. So, in a sense, only the first kid, the one that was allowed to establish these coordinations, really developed three-dimensional spatial vision. Saw things as located in particular parts of space. Second example, um, and again, kind of archaic looking device done in 1972 by back, I don't know how it, but the apparatus was a a, a, an array of tactile um, stimulators worn by blind subjects, either on their backs or their stomachs, that's what the little pad is there, and which was driven by a video camera, typically worn on the head, so that's what the glasses are there. How the device worked was that it, it let, it, sorry, what it did was it sent information that was now coded into a tactile stimulus um, onto the back or the stomach of the people who wore it, and the device worked marvelously well at letting blind subjects sort of see their surroundings, but only after an initial training period dur during which subjects were allowed to move around and actively explore their surroundings while wearing the apparatus. So the idea is for subjects whose cameras were not controlled by their own movements, either the camera was on someone else's head or mounted on a table or something or because the subjects were not allowed to move at all, such subjects did not get to the point where they interpreted the tactile array you know, that was coding visual information being sent to the pad um, as providing any dis distal spatial information at all. Subjects who wore the camera and were allowed to move around rather quickly got to the point where they could sort of non-inferentially interpret the tactile simulation as spatial perception of their surroundings. In a, so effectively what was happening was that the visual information was being replaced by the tactile information. They were able to see through the tactile information things as located at various places and move around you know, and interact with them in the way that we do with visual information. Now I want to turn quickly to a device called the Sonic Guide, whose purpose is to provide blind persons um, this is a real thing, with, uh, with a sense of distance for use in spatial navigation and perception. So, devices worn on the head transmits a continuous high frequency, inaudible, so that you know, nobody can hear it, but it transmits um, very high frequency probe tone, and then pick up, picks up echoes of that tone with a stereophonic microphone. The objects in the subject's vicinity reflect various components of the probe sound, and maybe complex and sort of ingenious ways, depending on their size, distance, orientation, and surfaces. So these are the little 
sort of rules, translation rules that translate the kind of sonic uh, probe tone coming back to the echo into spatial information. Echoes from a distance um, are translated to higher pitches than echoes from nearby. So as the surface moves toward the subject, the sound it reflects will be translated into a tone which gets lower in pitch. Something moving towards you gets lower in pitch. Echoes translated to lower, echo, weak echoes are translated to lower volumes. So an, uh, as an object approaches the subject, the subject will hear a tone which increases in volume. As the object gets closer, it will, ceteris paribus, reflect more sound energy resulting in a strong echo and gets lower in pitch. Um, because it's getting closer. So an object which merely grows but stays at a distance will stays at a distance will get louder but stay at the same pitch. Uh, echoes from soft surfaces, grass, fur, kittens, I guess, um, are translated to fuzzier tones while reflections from smooth uh, surfaces like glass, concrete are translated to pure tones. And this allows you know, the people wearing the device to distinguish, say, grass from concrete. And finally, the left-right positions of the reflecting surfaces translate into different arrival times of the translated sound of each ear. So, and notice that it's not required for this coding um, to exploit the same kind of internal, intraoral differences which code directly in normal subjects. It doesn't matter sort of how the information is coded, just that they're getting the information. Um, and in fact, if the differences are exaggerated substantially by the sort of coding scheme, then one would expect a better ability to judge angles, for example, than we actually have. So as John Heil describes the device, he says, sonic guide, this device, taps a wealth of auditory information ordinarily unavailable to human beings, information that overlaps in interesting ways with that afforded by vision, Spatial relationships, motion, shape, sizes of objects at a distance from the observer are detectable in the usual case only visually. So we only see space. The sonic guide provides a systematic and reliable means of hearing such things. So I'm going to suppose, and I, I, I hope you find this phenomenologically possible, that subjects who have been using the device for a while and become competent with it. Competent, I mean they're able to hear the information and use it immediately and non inferentially to guide their movements towards and away from and around their environments, towards and away from objects around their environments. That they actually perceive the objects in their environment directly rather than sort of reasoning out what the environment must be like on the basis of pitches and volumes. And in that sense, they really hear space in the sense that we see space. Their auditory sensations have spatial content. So we can actually know what it, is, it feels to be about. Exactly right. Yeah. So in employing this sort of guide, one ceases to be aware of vibrations on one's skin and becomes aware, rather, of objects and events scanned by the camera. Similarly, successful use, uh, sorry, yeah. successful use of the thing requires one to hear things and goings on rather than the echoes produced by the device. So you're no longer sort of uh, perceiving the sound and then inferring. You're just immediately perceiving something as located in a certain part of space and having a certain character, soft or fuzzy, big or small. So take, a, take an example of uh, a subject, someone who and become competent in, this, in using this device and call her Casey, who's been using it from birth and is really you know, competent but has become completely integrated into her sensory motor um, activity. So for her, a pitch at 35 dB at middle C has a clear egocentric spatial content of an object such and such a size located over there. She doesn't hear the sound so much as hear the object. Just as normal subjects don't see the light so much as they see objects. Upon hearing such a sound, Casey would be prepared to immediately non-inferentially orient towards it, point at it, try to hit it with the dart in the same way that our visual experience allows us to do something. However, if you or not, you or I, were to sort of put the thing on, 
The same sound would carry no spatial content for us. It wouldn't have spatial significance at all. It would just be a sound. If asked to orient towards it or hit it with a dart, or whether it was a soft or fuzzy surface, we would be just at a loss. It wouldn't have any spatial significance. So how would you go about hitting middle C, say, with a dart? Casey's brain is now set up so that the different manifolds are viewed with genuine spatial content, or auditory experience has genuine spatial content. What the example does is it sort of loosens the pre-theoretic presumption that there's something just naturally spatial about vision. I think that the normally sighted brain has to, not just me, I mean, but what the work suggests is that the normally sighted brain has to engage in a lot of work in order to imbue visual um, experience with spatial content in the same way that Casey's brain has to do something in order to imbue her auditory experience with genuine spatial content. So what's the difference between you and Casey? Casey's been wearing the same thing with, from birth, you just put the thing on, you know, a few minutes ago, she hears space, you do not. Her, her auditory experience is experience of space, while yours in the required sense is not, even when you're wearing the guide and getting the same information, and thus guaranteeing that you're having all of the spatial information there. So the most plausible answer is that Casey has learned to use the device and you have not, in a way that's given more precise content by this talk about coordinating manifolds. So what does learn to use mean in Casey's case, but not in yours? The auditory experience is such as to be able to non-inferentially cue and guide sensory motor activity. Her sensory, in this case, auditory and motor manifolds are coherently and appropriately coordinated so as to allow for the skillful execution of a range of activities in, in, um, in terms of a common reference. So that's the idea. So what does coherently and appropriately coordinated mean? Well, remember that I mean, I mean the idea of coordination in a, in a very inclusive sense to cover ranges of input, right? as well as ranges of output. So not just sensory input, but kind of motor output. And that in much the same way that one can specify a stimulus location by means of coordinates tied to sense organs, retinal photoreceptor A, tactile photoreceptor B, and so on. One can specify various aspects of motor activity in terms of coordinates as well. So for instance, it's, 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 um, in, it's impossible to specify, specify the location of my hand relative to my torso by giving, it is possible, sorry, to specify the location of my hand relative to my torso by giving angles in my shoulder and elbow joints. And as I said, coordinating sensation and action could just be described in terms of coordinating manifolds. So I want to say a little bit more about that now. So I use the term coordination to refer to an operation which just establishes systematic relations between elements of multiple manifolds. But there are two types of coordination. There's just coincidence coordination, or C coordination and what I'm going to call stabilization coordination, two manifolds are C-coordinated if they have subparts that are identified. Right? So just think of yourself as you know, identifying points across maps that, over, that, that overlap in terms of spatial content. So you take a map of California and a map of Oregon, and they sort of, so long as they overlap a little bit, you can C-coordinate them by just identifying points across these maps. A little bit of Northern California on the Southern and Oregon, for example. So one coordinates the two partial maps to construct a, 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 um, a bigger map that includes the two of them. The bigger map may be virtual. In, the, in this case, there's no need to actually physically abut the map. You just need to sort of coordinate across them. And you, you make up a bigger map by just establishing a C coordination between two smaller maps. The two component maps might even be at very different scales and thus impossible to kind of physically conjoin. None of that matters. You just have to establish this sort of virtual connection between the two to get a bigger map. Now, an S coordination is something like that, except it's the establishment of a relationship between elements in more than one manifold, which effectively stabilizes higher order elements that may themselves form an additional manifold. So I'll say what I mean. So consider a very simple 
um, example. It's uh, in a two-dimensional realm, so I'm looking at a screen, an eye is pointed at, that, you know, that has eyes pointed at. The eye can move left or right. When a light appears on the screen, its location on the screen relative to the eye cannot be determined from the location of the retina to which the light projects because the eye can have, uh, so the head can have different um, orientation. So the mirror relationship between the point of the retina and, and the position of the thing on the screen is, uh, sorry, the mere point on the retina at which the eye is reflected isn't sufficient to identify the place of the light on the screen. For simplicity, I'm just gonna suppose that the lights are equidistant, so distance is not a factor in the so given, but given both the location of the retinal stimulation and the angle of the eye's orientation, the angle of the eye's orientation, it's possible to determine the location of the screen. So direction, uh, sorry, the, the direction from which the light is coming from. So the location of the light on the screen. So what that means, the fact that these two things specify the location of the light on the screen, means that if, if, if eye orientation is given by the vertical axis and retinal rotation is given by the horizontal axis, um, every point on the two-dimensional representation stands for an ordered pair of retinal location and eye, low eye orientation. And these contours are sets of such ordered pairs, each of which corresponds to the same light location. So by establishing these contours, by becoming selectively sensitive, that is, to points that lie along a particular contour, a system can stabilize the relationship between the two one-dimensional manifolds represented in the axes to stabilize then a single higher dimensional one-dimensional manifold the contour itself, representing the position of the light source. Again, this is just all a way of kind of systematizing the idea of what it takes to stabilize um, to, to um, to, to stabilize two manifolds so that they're co coherently um, coordinated with one another. And then the contour can carry information about spatial location. In, in that any further mechanism of the system that's selectively sensitive now to points on a particular contour can thereby be uh, selectively sensitive to a given location. So this case where you've got a lot higher dimension manifold and you form equivalence boxes and then you've got the manifold with the equivalence but yeah. you push down. So is that, I mean, is that what you mean in general? Exactly or is that right. a special case? That's exactly yeah. right. So that's what stabilization coordination means. You, you create a higher dimensional manifold points on which correspond to contours, you know, in the two-dimensional case or, or you know, kind of, you know, stabilize, you know, multi-dimensional contours in the general case. So I'm actually going to skip ahead a slightly more complicated example, and that probably suffices. Okay. So the examples, the one I just skipped, <laughs> the, one, the simple one, provide a kind of illustration of S coordination, how that works. <coughs> works together with C coordination, how they can interact so as to generate a kind of unified region of sensory motor stability um, from a bunch of disunified manifolds that move with respect to one another that are, that are anchored to a common torso. So you stabilize the relationships between them such that once you've specified locations on multiple manifolds and, and have them coherently coordinated, you now have a conception of egocentric space that lets you locate you know, using information from any number of a set of uh, sensory pathways. Um, the idea that something is located in a particular place, which it can then do equivalence processes of, of kind of motor um, action to get, to get at the thing. And then and only then do you have a conception of egocentric space and of things as being located at a particular location in space. So the end result of this sort of coordination process is, just, is what I mean by saying there is an egocentric space for that creature. It has egocentric spatial contents. Um, and what the egocentric space is, is just a higher, 
higher order three dimensional manifold angle anchored to the torso, which can, though it needn't in every case, serve as a kind of common frame for all of the lower, lower order sensory as well as motor manifolds that are coordinated with it. The sense in which the manifold is implicit is that it's not given explicitly. Yeah, the sense in which egocentric space is, is implicit. It's not given explicitly in any of the in any of the inputs or outputs. Nor is it explicitly represented by a separate map. It's like the sort of it's a virtual high order map that's created by stabilizing the relationships between all of these these other manifolds that do have direct kind of um, kind of you know representation on you know retinal arrays or, or tactile. Uh, receptors. Okay, so three points worth mentioning here. First, the egocentric space may very well require a sort of map maintenance to require stable, as one gets a new pair of glasses, or more obviously when one wears those sorts of prisms, and I talk about that alter the relationship between the kind of visual information and head eye movement and so on, and change of retinal location. So it takes some time to get used to, you know, um, you know when, when things are deliberately and externally manipulated so that you that the coordination that's been established is now upset. It takes you a little bit while to get used to it, but you do very quickly actually <coughs> to regain stability. Second, once the behavioral space has been constructed, it's not exclusively tied to any modality. It results from a coordination of different lower level manifolds and sensory manifolds. <coughs> Third, the stabilizations required to create the egocentric space, again, something I already emphasized, is that the stabilizations, which depend as much on motor manifolds as they do on sensory manifolds, neither in isolation could possibly provide the materials for the construction of egocentric space. Okay. Um, as each provides the sort of the friction which the other ones need. It's only because an organism is driven to coordinate sensation and action that a single higher order, higher order manifold must be established in relation to which both sensory and motor manifolds are ultimately stabilized. Okay, so all of this is to show you that there's a rather a lot going on in the brain to make it possible for you to see space. And the, the sort of what presents itself is the immediate awareness of what I call before this kind of visible and tactile reality of space is actually quite complex, what it means to see something at a particular location in space. Um, so now I'm going to just assert, without defending a claim about content, which I'm hoping you'll find phenomenologically plausible, the content of an element E of a manifold M is determined in part by the character of the manifold but also in part by the character of all of the manifolds that it's coordinated with. So what this means is that part of the content, say, of a visual stimulus is provided by how one would orient towards that scene. And how one could move one's arm in order to bring the hand to that point. Such as the thing graspable by reaching. That's so part of what it means to see something is located in a particular part of space Part of what it means to have that thought is to be able to sort of know that what you have to do to get at it. Part of the content of a felt location is given by how one would visually orient toward that location, how the hand would look when the eyes are trained on it, and so on. Okay. So let's return to Casey, that person who's been using the sonic guide since birth. What has affected the transition for her from auditory sensations comprising near manifolds? So pitch is volume, it's just being selectively sensitive to pitch and volume, to providing genuinely spatial experience. It's her coordination of these auditory manifolds with the other sensory and motor manifolds at her disposal. The same information is given, is available to Casey when she puts, you know, when she's using the thing, as available to us when we just put it on. The difference is the way that this information is coordinated with the other sensory and motor manifolds. In Casey's case, the spatial import arises because she has affected this coordination. Um, the, co the, the, spa the, the auditory information, tone, volume, and so on, is now coordinated with the other sensory motor manifolds. With us, when we just put the thing on, it's not. So part of the content for her of a middle C, for example, 
at 35 decibels is the thing graspable thusly and the thing I could center my head at, on by moving so and so, the thing I could hit with this dart by throwing it. That's all part of the content of an MC at 35 decibels. Okay, um, so this is what learning to use the device meant, this, you know, what, what I mean by coordinating manifolds. This provides the content to the elements in the manifold that's provided by this space. And the elements and locations in this space get their spatial content from the entire web of sensory and motor manifolds that go into the construction of the egocentric space. The acquisition of those coordinations is, in part, is part and parcel of the acquisition of sensory motor skills. Being able to move one's eyes towards a herd stimulus to reach out for a seen object. When the appropriate manifolds have been coordinated, it's not required, of course, that one actually engage in all of the sort of, uh, in any, uh, engage all or any of the coordinating manifolds in order for them to contribute to the content of some element of one of the manifolds. It can be part of the content of a point of light in my visual field, for example, that the sort of thing on which, that it is the sort of thing on which I could bring this or that motor action to bear, even if I don't in fact engage in any motor action. So all of your experience, once this coordination has been established, all of it that's coordinated with the other manifolds is spatial in character. The experience will cope, will cue a host of patterns of motor engage, engagement conditionally on your wanting to engage and wanting to reach out and grasp the thing and so on. So what distinguishes a merely physiological manifold from one that's genuinely spatial is that what one has genuinely spatial content in case it is coordinated in the right way with the other sensory motor manifolds. In the normal case, smell, taste, pitch, and anything else we might think of as a mere manifold are not coordinated in such a way with motor activity in the way that visual information and tactile information is for us because they're not coordinatable with such activity and mutatis mutandis for other kinds of non-spatial motor actions. So the pitch of a bird call, for example, is not normally something that varies in any systematic way with how you might move your head or your arms. Appara the apparatus like the sonic guide was constructed to allow, to, to allow certain things such as pitch and volume to be coordinatable with motor actions in such a way to guide the, as to guide the execution of those, ex those actions. The idea is, again, the stimulus, the mere sensation doesn't have any intrinsic spatial content. <coughs> it can be viewed with spatial content that carries the right information that allows it to be coordinated with motor activity. Okay. So neither sensation nor action carry any spatial content intrinsically, spatial content is built within via the stabilization of higher order three-dimensional manifolds, lower level manifolds, both sensory and motor. Only some of the sort of efferents and afferents are coordinatable with this manifold because only some of them ordinarily vary in the right way um, so that they are coordinatable with it. So manipulations of glandular excretions are not, while well, manipulations of joint muscle tensions are. Retinal locations are, while well, pitches, at least in the normal case, are not. So what your, your brain is doing is exploiting these sorts of systematic relationships between the manifolds to create this higher order dimensional space. Higher order three dimensional space. And that's what, that's what you think of as physical space. So what's being suggested here is that the entire web of coordinated sensory motor manifolds and the higher order three-dimensional spatial manifold constituted by this web, once they're coordinated, act as the kind of unsupplied supplier of spatial content. That's what it means to have immediate awareness of the visual and actual reality of space in cognitive terms. Now, so, Proposals for the neural mechanisms of all of this um, are sort of both outside the scope of my own expertise, and there's a lot that's unsettled uh, about this. That's all cognitive neuroscience, and, um, what, what, and a lot of the details are unsettled, but I wanted to give you a sketch of how it works sort of in the brain 
sort of behind the scenes to support you know, our ability to see space and the sense of that immediate awareness of the tangible and visible reality of space as we experience. Now notice that the coordination process that's required for, say, this, the kinematic specification of, say, hand position in egocentric space. The position of the hand in egocentric space cannot be determined by the angle of the elbow alone, such as shoulder, at, because, since as the shoulder reorients, the same angle information can place the hand in different locations. But given both hand and shoulder angle, the position of the hand relative to the torso, that is, the position of the hand in egocentric space, can be determined. And it's only because Creatures must coordinate sensation and action through all of these, uh, through, sorry, sensation and action through sensory systems and motor systems that are all connected to the torso on a variety of kind of movable platforms, neck, shoulders, etc. It's only because of that that a higher order, higher order space centered on that common platform, the torso, is needed in order to coordinate. So if we were sort of stationary trees that couldn't move our heads around and so on, we wouldn't need all of the sort of complicated coordination that's going on behind the scenes. But the implicit anchor of the egocentric space is what I'm going to call the point of view. Point of view is the sort of the implicit nexus of behavioral efficacy constituted by the coordination of sensation and action. Um, but it's not really a point. It's a frame of reference with as many dimensions and all of the asymmetries of the space it represents. And it's not really a view, since it's not tied to vision in any direct sense, in any central sense. Now, this isn't the end of the story, the stabilization of egocentric space, which is a sort of frame-dependent space centered on, um, on, on uh, the, the torso. We don't just represent space in egocentric terms. Egocentric spatial representation is one that's implicitly relativized to a point of view. So it's not yet objective space in the sense that we began talking about before. Locations are specified in the complex way that we, that, um, that we talked about by their relationships to perception and action. We also, we, also, and there are lots of animals that only represent in egocentric terms. But we represent space in objective terms that is in a way that's not relativized to a point of view. Many organisms have a point of view in the sense that their brain stabilizes sensation and action by, you know, by, by means of a coherent, a coherent three-dimensional space centered on their point of view. We have maps that represent spatial relations in a manner that's invariant under transformations between points of view. That's a further degree of articulation that may or may not be uniquely human. And the formal difference between egocentric and, um, and objective space is one that's familiar in physics as a difference between frame-dependent and frame-independent representations of space. The additional articulation that separates the way that space is from our point of view on it is needed in order to understand the difference between, for example, changes in experience due to changes in the world and changes in experience due to changes in my position in it. It's needed to understand how you and I, for example, can be seeing the very same thing or looking at the very same object, though our experiences are quite different because we're located at different places relative to it. So there's a lot to say in cognitive terms about how the brain stabilizes in that sense the objective conceptual space, the conceptual space as distinct from one's point of view on it. But it fits relatively smoothly into um, what I've already said. Notice here all of the articulations sort of going on on the inside um, about how experience acquires spatial import. The additional articulation is articulation in our concepts that gets imposed on experience in the perceptual process so that what we see when we open our eyes is, that is to say, what I was calling the percept, has that articulation built into its content. So you open your eyes and you just see something that's located in a different part of space. And that carries all of the implications about how you get to it, if you wanted to reach it, what somebody located over on the other side of it is seeing, if they're looking at it, and so on. So the elements of egocentric space achieve objective import, 
objective importance in the sense that they acquire significance as, you know, um, uh, as, 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 you know, fully objective in the sense that you're looking at an object independent of your point of view that other people can look at and that, that, that exists even when you're not looking at it and so on. Um, is C coordinated with a spatial mapping? That, so your experience acquires that kind of import, that fully objective import when it's C coordinated with a manifold, um, a spatial manifold that's independent of your point of view, capable in principle of supporting um, arbitrary coordination with your egocentric manifold. That kind of coordination requires explicitly representing your point of view, just as a formal. Fact. You have to place the you are here dot. And so interestingly, it introduces the conception of yourself as a thing in the world, the possessor of a point of view, and your experience as a product of the way the world is on the one hand, and the way that you are situated in it on the other. So your experience of an object located over there, you know, depends both on the way the object is and on your relationship to it. Um, and that introduces the conception of experience as a kind of relational. The content of experience is now intrinsically relational. It gives much information about the world as of your relationship to the world. The predictive coding is a little less clumsy. We can say that the generative, oh, sorry. We can say that, that what, what I'm representing is me as an embodied subject moving through a spatial landscape and I interpret sensory information in a way that seems most likely given what's already known about the way the world is and the way that I am. And this is stuff that'll come up actually a little bit more explicitly <coughs> next time and I'll come up there. So what I see when I look around me is objects located in parts of an objective space. Immediately and non-inferentially, that's what I see viewed from a particular location. So that's just mostly what I wanted to talk about. I want to sort out what's controversial um, in, from what I said, from what's not. So it's not controversial that we represent the world spatially, and that we have both egocentric and non-egocentric, or uncentered and variant objective, or allocentric representations. The outlines of how the brain integrates sensory information into an egocentric and then an, an allocentric representation. That's broadly understood. Questions about the neural mechanisms of how this is all implicated, implemented are not well known. The connection between space and objectivity um, is philosophically controversial. That is, there's a question about whether um, in order to have a conception of an objective world, it has to be conceived spatially. Now, I think um, if that's interpreted in a strong way, so that objectivity is necessarily spatial, where spatial is given specific geometric content, that's controversial and probably not true. Um, but not if interpreted in a weak way. That is, if in us objectivity and spatial represented are sort of, and spatial representation are sort of coeval in human cognition. It's clear that for us, those two things go together. Some people argue about whether representational content, so I've used this notion of what you see and so on. A lot of people in the cognitive science literature argue about that, partly because the notion of representational content is contested and um, and that stuff. I think there's sort of arcane debates about what really, what, what representational content is and how to apply the notion um, to experience. That's contested, but not in ways I think that matter um, for, for our purposes. What matters for us is that there's a personal level of representation, so a first personal level of, the level of conscious awareness um, at, which the experience, at which experience of various kinds visual, auditory, tactual, as the case may be, has spatial content and acquires that content, I've argued, in virtue of being appropriately coordinated with one another and with motor responses. 
A hypothesis is that, in a sense, it is in that sense that our own visual experience has spatial content. It is in that same sense in which we have immediate perceptual awareness of the visual, the visible and tangible reality of space. And it is in that sense that our experience of the world, our experience of the world, is fundamentally spatial. You open your eyes, you see a spatially structured world that you can see, touch, hear, and smell. You experience yourself as a material presence in an environment that pushes and pulls and can be pushed and pulled in its turn. From a first-person perspective, it's very hard not to think of perception as a transparent channel that gives us immediate awareness of, again, visible and tangible reality of space. But what we're finding when we sort of lift the veil and look at what's going on below the threshold of experience, these below the threshold, that is to say, of conscious awareness, is that the brain is working quite hard to process neural signals coming in through different sensory pathways and processed by different brain regions to come together for a kind of spatial and temporally unified picture of the world. I'll talk a little bit more about time next time. What's given in perception, that is to say, is the prepared product of a lot of processing by the brain. What's really there is signal that's structured in a certain way. And I mean, a part, of, part of what was illuminating to me about this material is I think it gives you new ways of trying to think about what it, what it might mean to recover our spatial experience. So, Intersubjective space because our ego-centric space are adequately similar because our brains are adequately similar. So we can think of an alien species whose brain is so different from ours that their ego-centric space would be so different that we would not be able to get any sort of grasp of intersubjective space with them. Um, so it depends on the details, right? So it depends on whether or not the kind of information they're getting, the kind of information we're getting, can be coordinated by a prior order manifold. So imagine a creature like this. Um, they're actually, they're sort of spatially located in a distributed way, right? So they have movable hands that separate from their bodies, and they're getting visual information maybe from very high up, and they have to coordinate their, their information into a kind of stable manifold. That, that you know can relate their tactile experience to their visual experience. And whether or not we can coordinate these creatures as experience is different enough for, from our own will depend on whether or not we can you know establish stabilize you know kind of a, a, like a map effectively where we can locate our experience on that map, locate their experience on that map, so that there's now you know a way for us to interpret their visual information as giving us information that we can coordinate with. That's that's the idea. Some cases maybe not. If there's no, if there's not enough, if there's not sufficient overlap in content, it might be impossible for us to kind of coordinate it. Most of the people that work on 
vision, have very little doubt that space is real, that we live in a concrete world. They're just looking at the process that goes on in the brain. So that was one. one. Uh, so my question in particular is, uh, there, there's a lot of things that you're talking about, but one of the things that you're talking about, one of the things that you're talking about, one of the things that you're talking about, depends on how flush I think is the materialism was and it was working on this but uh, is the integration happening in a particular localized region of the brain or it's completely completely different. distributed. Um, and in fact I mean that you know one of the issues that's been interesting is a lot of people actually Carla and I were talking about this a lot of people started getting excited about actually finding that there seemed to be topographical um, sort of maps in the brain of, for example, you know, visual information. So it looks like you know, if you're looking at two contiguous points in space, you can find a part of the brain where two contiguous points um, sort of light up. Um, there are no maps of ego, topographical maps of egocentric space in the brain. So location relative to your torso. And so a lot of people thought, oh, well, uh, you know, we're not representing egocentric space, but the point is that, you know, Actually, you know, representation has to do with the stabilization of these higher order manifolds. It's not, it's not like the maps in the brain. Is that the question? Yeah. yeah. Yes. Yeah. So I was thinking, if I understood the, uh, some of the experiments show or suggest that if you don't have this coordination and modes of coordination, so you don't have the spatial representation. But what if you say, well, if you don't have the coordination, you don't have true spatial representation. But in most cases, you might have, you might be representing things as being in space. You see, like the contrast between. Yes, yes. Okay. So I think the thing to say, sort of from this framework, is well, it can't really be space in the sense that we mean it, because part of what we mean by seeing an object as at a particular location is that I could get to it. So that was the point of that sort of claim about content, content, that the content of my, of the idea that I have when I see something at a certain location is completely right into the content, that it has these motor implications for how I would get to it if I knew to it. And if you have thoughts, what if sometimes you have thoughts in spatial representations? So those shouldn't count as representing something at a point, because if you try to reach it, you will not represent it. So we're, well, we're sort of talking at the level of what it takes for a being to have the capability of forming thoughts about space. And so the thought would be, of course we have the ability, and because we have the ability we can um, misapply it, so we can be wrong in certain cases. We have the ability to have thoughts, the thought that something is located in a particular part of space. But we can be wrong about, you know, whether something is located there. But the trees, you know, kind of wouldn't have the capability of having that thought. Kind of, yeah. 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 I have two questions. <coughs> um, what is vague? What is specific? The, the, the first, the third one is, is for me. I listen to all that, and then um, I have two reactions. There are two philosophers in my mind. In my mind, one of them says, "Oh, look how." Complicated is the work between uh, the perception and the representation. How much is immense? Is. So it gives this this gives a sense of distance between, the, and it pushes me towards some kind of less realistic attitude. Um, but then there is another philosophical side. Of it. Oh look, how much work is done, um, which is clearly uh, focused uh, to get uh, uh, closer to. Uh, yeah. An actual reality, given the vagueness of my perception. So, in fact, it gives me a strong, the, the realist philosophy the realist is, is, is happy with how much all this works for the construction reality. Did you see what I was yeah, 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 absolutely. And then, and as you're saying, the, the scientists that do this uh, have start the very language they use is look, I mean, there's this and this and this clearly located in space, so that's a fact of the world. Let's see how the how much our brain has to work to actually get to this. Um, how do you? Uh, what's okay, your so, what's, 
which philosophers do you use today? So I, I'm going to say, first of all, there's more stuff that we'll talk about next time that I think you know, adds some structure to this. And, um, I, I don't have a dog in, in this fight. I think one of the thing, one of the ways in which you can help, and again, you know, this I'm sort of offering it to people who are worried about recovering space. So I think there's a way in which I'm giving away part of the punchline, but you know, there's a way in which people have conceived of the program. Wait, okay, so wait, look back. What's well, certainly not right, I think. Um, is that there's sort of a kind of naive realism about space that one is strongly, pre-theoretically inclined to, inclined to, which is that space is just given. Space is just given in perception. Okay. Um, and I think that's just not right. I mean, it is given in perception, but not in a way that should lead you to believe in direct realism, you know, direct naive realism about space. Now, what that does, not necessarily, but it opens up the idea that uh, to challenge one of the ways in which um, sort of I think that the that people are at least tacitly assuming when they talk about recovering space um, in sort of programs and quantum The and I think you know Christian touched on it. I, I think kind of without questioning that part of what that means is that recovering an external concrete structure that has something like the structure of general relativistic models, at least with the theory. Um, I think this raises questions about what really is required to recover space, and what we mean is ultimately to recover a spatial experience. And, and here I don't mean to be like sort of making a lunge for idealism. I mean, taking the idea that, well, what is the, kind of the burden of a part of physics is to generate a signal. Mm -hmm. You know, the mind does a lot of work to, you know, imbue the signal with what we're thinking of as spatial content. Okay, uh, and, um, yeah, I'm very happy with that. In fact, let me, let me get to the second question, and which explains... Can I say one more thing? I mean, this is one of the ways in which I think it, it feeds very naturally into your own ideas, is that you know, spatial experience has to be the product of a coupling between an agent and... Um, right. You can think that we're... Clearly our senses are tapping into some real structure. But there's a more complicated story here about how that structure is physically... Right. Okay. Exactly. Yeah. 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 I'm very happy with this, and, and I mean, I, I'm, I'm talking this afternoon, and I feel something related to that is, is coming. My second question is more technical, but you see, it's, it's, it's something listening to all that that seems to be missing. In in, but this is a completely naive observation. Um, I do locate things in in my brain um, in some space and um, I do locate things related to my mode of activity to get there. Uh, I mostly locate things with respect to one another. I mean, I, I don't think that uh, the work that I do in my brain uh, to see where is the dot of the, of the eye there uh, it's a complicated work to um, stabilize it with respect to moving with my head uh, in some abstract space. I just stabilize it with respect to what's around. If I, if I had to orient myself in, 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 in Paris, I know where is the Eiffel, Eiffel Tower and I know some objects. And then I refer the other objects with respect to those. Uh, is there any work on this relative localization? as the ground for localization of things and perceptions? Okay, so it's a good question. Um, and one of the ways in which we can tell me if I'm understanding it properly, let's, let's consider two different models. And it's just for convenience so that we don't have to talk about what's going on in us. We can imagine constructing beings that represent, constructing computer sort of you yeah. know, virtual beings that, that, that process spatial information in two ways. One of them goes through this complicated process that um, I described in terms of stabilizing an egocentric space, and then has you know, a map, and it keeps track of its point of view along the map, and in order to know whether it's where something is located, where A is located relative to B, it locates them both with respect to its own point of view, and then another might, might 
not take that D through or T tour through egocentric representation. It starts with the map, maybe like a GPS of a car or something. Um, and your thought was it, it localizes things with respect to another without localizing them with respect to itself. Is that the thought? No, what I'm saying is that there's a shortcut. I don't have to localize every object one by one. Um, once I know that this wall is there, uh, the chalk is just near the wall. Oh, okay, yeah, no, so, so that, yeah. this is immensely shortcuts. Right, this so way. this is part of the framework, is that part of what it means for the chalk to be, once you're representing the, you know, kind of space in allocentric terms, and it's in this sort of frame independent way, part of what it means for the wall to be over there is, is for it to be located at a certain place on an objective map on which you have all sorts of other representations of things, right? So part of what the what what you get from locating the chalk on that map is all of the information you've already got encoded in the map gets brought to bear for you to locate it relative to other things. That's it. So the richer and the more fully detailed your map and the spatial information that gets encoded on it, as soon as you locate some other item, you know, um, in say that you're looking at on that map. You've now located it relative to all of those other things. Go back to um, reply to the first question and comment to the first talk on the recovery of classical material system. Um, and you, you get a bit of, you know, um, not recovery um, the space time to physics, but maybe uh, there is psychological, psychophysical support mm -hmm. from mm -hmm. mental physics. Which might not be quite classical or quite spiritual portals directly to the experiences. Instead of taking these work from fundamental physics to classical space time, with mm -hmm. mentality, and then to symbolic experiences. Is that part of it? Yeah. Yeah, again, I don't have a dog in this fight. I'm sort of offering okay. it. Um, but that's part of the thought. Let's, let's re examine what it means so that you know think of the model and play with that. Now look our evidence is we locate something in a particular place in space. Um, I'm, let's really look at what it means to see something as located in a particular place in space. Right. I was wondering whether um, we have any uh, we should have any um, given our current scientific stories of physics and psychology, how they can happen. Usually, when we do psychological or we do scientific experiments, we do assume, you know, we get a stimuli, we do this kind of description. There are a lot of classical elements, yeah. like dimensional pointers and you know, yeah. flash of screen and so on. And I was wondering if you want to have a psychological story of what's going on in the lab and in the stimuli and experiences, we should say all of that to maybe for fundamental physics. For us. And that seems to be um, um, more unwieldy than I say take the deep first to recover to the mechanism physical space time and then to experience. Yep, absolutely. It's it's uh, it's total frontier and it's uh the rest. And I uh, you know again I keep sort of you know, making my next talk redundant, but it's really hard in a temporal case to I mean put aside space, how do you re recast all of this without time as an external problem? Thanks. So it's very interesting. I was just wondering if I could press you on this idea that um, looking at sort of physiologically how um, external space gets represented, we can um, sort of remove some pressure um, on fundamental physics to re recover some sort of classical geometrical structures. Um, but I'm, I'm a little bit worried that we might not have actually um, removed ourselves so far from that demand. So uh, presumably, this higher order space in which you locate objects. Um, also, through this coordination, it provides them means to, um, to sort of um, coordinate different views in visual, visual space. So that's going to correspond to something like the projective structure, um, you know, political geometry. But also, there's going to be metrical information um, to do with the coordination of like, the visual field and how we move through it. Um, so that's going to give us a notion of, of distance. So maybe it's not going to be precise enough to say that it's Euclidean, but it's going to be roughly Euclidean. And maybe not absolute, and then it's got these other relationships. 
So um, I guess, I mean, I, I really like this idea, but I'm, I'm just curious where, where that space comes in. It seems like if, um, if the responsibility of physics is just to uh, make our beliefs about space based on our internal representations come out through, or roughly through, um, it seems like the, the problem looks fairly similar in that you, you still have a classical geometrical space with a metric and metric structure. I mean, I don't know that that's right. Yeah, so there has to be work on both ends, right? To figure out what what kind of structure has to be there already and as I put it exactly in the signal. Um, to be able to support genuine spatial perception and coordination, not just you know internally, but in just that. I think those are the questions. Yeah. Can I just thank you? We sort of have to wrap up, I guess, with maybe a few so I mean, because I was thinking exactly the same, the same thing. Um, so one thing I would say, um, so Alan, there's some work done by Alan Shepard, who actually suggests the space isn't Euclidean; it's actually a slightly negative curvature. There's sort of a, like a, a sort of empirical story you can tell about why you might think that. Is this like uh, Reed's geometry crystals? So it's experiments where you have some kind of little shape, and you kind of time how long it takes for people to sort of. Well, there's two of them, and you sort of have to rotate Rattish. it back to see which one it was. Which one it is. Sorry, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Not yet. Right, 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 right. They did a Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that, 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 that's part of that. Um, maybe that was what saying. Yeah, I was going to say, it's a, well, I guess the other thing I wanted to throw in here, when was the, when was the mark? Hey, what book you were studying from? Uh, is it before the Quang before 1905? It was an Okay, yeah, okay. yes. Yeah, because Quang Kare, the, the expert, whatever it is, in um, Science and Hypothesis, the a Science and Hypothesis also talks very much along yeah. this kind of yeah. lines, right? And for him, the metrical thing comes from the existence of rigid bodies, and so the root structure of the I mean, the as well. I wrote a paper about this. So those are, yeah, I'm sorry, that's really, I guess I should confess that. Actually, no, you should make that the paper, actually. Tell them I think it's such cool stuff. But I think we should probably break for lunch. And but wait, wait, tell them, them where to find the paper. Sorry? Tell them where to find your paper. Uh, it was in a PSA. Um, it was in, um, in Austin, whatever, the PSA in Austin. I don't know where that was. Um, it's in the proceedings there, with, with a bill. I'll decide it and I'll give you the citation next time. Okay. But I mean, it, it, you know, it, it's not, it doesn't do anything in fact, it's just kind of thinking a little bit about some of those issues. Okay. Thanks. And I'm really glad to see you. Thank you very much.